Okay, welcome everyone to this week's CDAC webinar, number 83 in our series, in fact. Uh, today, uh, we're featuring Brent Fultz, a longtime collaborator and one of the founding partners in CDAC. Brent was also for nine years a member of our companion Energy Frontier Research Center and has uh, trained many students and postdocs who've gone off into the DOE and DOE NSA laboratories. Brent is well known broadly in material science, in part for his excellent textbook and also for his work in electron microscopy and neutron scattering. Brent obtained his uh, bachelor's degree from MIT in physics and a master's and PhD from Berkeley in engineering science, and he focused on Mussbauer spectroscopy there. After several years at Lawrence Berkeley Lab, he moved to Caltech in 1985 and rose through the ranks. And since 2013, he's been the Barbara and Stanley Ron Jr. Professor of Material Science and Applied Physics. Two years ago, in fact, two years ago this week, Brent gave a talk on phonon entropy at high pressures and temperatures. So we're welcoming him back now to uh, tell us about the Invar effect. So thank you very much for giving this talk. Thanks, Ross. It's, it's Great to be back, as they say. Uh, let me see if I can get my screen working here appropriately. Now, I think, uh, let's see which mode are we in. Uh, you're, uh, I gotta switch displays, I think, or uh, is it okay? It's display mode. At the All right, let me on the bottom. Oh, it looks okay, actually. I just have to do that, Perfect. right? Perfect. Okay, thanks. So I avoided working on the NVAR effect for many years because there were so many publications on it and the focus on the uh, magnetic behavior was a little bit beyond what we could realistically understand. Uh, but I saw an opportunity and uh, Stefan Lohaus and uh, Pedro Guzman are going to be doing their PhD theses <clears throat> on an experimental study uh, of the thermodynamics of INVAR. Uh, this is something that uh, has worked out uh, better than expected and we had a little luck on the way i have to say it's something that you can't guarantee will work i'll explain that as we go along of course uh the uh, uh methods uh, involve looking at something that has zero thermal expansion we'll call that the invar effect basically and we did it uh at the advanced photon source at uh, sector three uh the uh nuclear resonant inelastic x-ray scattering and nuclear forward scattering measurements on the iron 57 doped or iron 57 enriched uh, invar uh, the iron nickel classic alloy over a range of pressures we only did two temperatures but that's enough to confirm that there's no thermal expansion and came up with a thermodynamic explanation so what's new here is that the uh, uh, magnetic properties of INVAR were always uh, the source of interest and still are uh, very interesting magnetic behavior. But what was missing from the explanations to date has been the phonons. Uh, the, there's been a little bit of hint at that in the literature, but I think that the phonons make all the difference in understanding the INVAR effect, as I'll try to convince you. Of course, you need the magnetic parts too, but uh, uh, the two together really make a delicate balance. So. Uh, we have uh, uh, these measurements over uh, 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 a range of temperatures and pressures. And in the course of doing that, uh, we noticed another phenomena, which I might have time for at the end, uh, for how we can look at the uh, strength of magnon phonon interactions uh, by the behavior of the phonons through Curie temperatures. And uh, there's some uh, surprising uh, uh, connections that I'm not sure I'll have time for, but I'll get, maybe we'll see. Okay, so. Invar effect. Uh, it's got a lot of anomalies associated with it. Besides the vanishing thermal expansion, there's a long list of anomalous physical properties here. I won't read them all off, but you can kind of look through them. There are electromagnetic properties mostly. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, some of them, uh, of course, are related to mechanical uh, behaviors as well. Uh, they tend to be found in 3D transition metals. Uh, the uh, uh, red uh, on the right are all transition metals, but iron platinum and iron palladium are really quite interesting. We just started to look at that uh, ourselves. So anyway, uh, the uh, work required uh, uh, 
capabilities of working with very small samples in a diamond anvil cell and doing the inelastic and uh, elastic scattering by exciting iron 57 nuclei. I'll explain these techniques in just a minute, but I just wanted to show you the general configuration here. We have uh, uh, a hutch with a, a diamond anvil cell in it. Uh, it can be cooled uh, so we can measure at room temperature and at low temperatures. And uh, the uh, uh, forward beam uh, gives us one of our spectra, which has to do with the magnetism. And the uh, scattering from the side gives us our phonon information. Uh, so we can get both, uh, not simultaneously, but with the same configuration and at the same beam time, basically. These are um, wide opening panoramic cells with avalanche photodiodes squeezed right in to the sample, which has to have beryllium gaskets to the x-rays through it. The nuclear forward scattering just uh, is much more straightforward and it's fairly quick in comparison, especially with these enriched samples. So the basic idea here is that the nuclear excitations are very narrow in energy and very long lived in time, uh, 100 nanoseconds or so. Uh, so the electronic properties after a synchrotron flash hits the sample decay kind of quickly. And if we look at the detector signals after, I don't know, 20 uh, nanoseconds or so, it's almost pure nuclear decay. So this is how we do the uh, nuclear scattering and separate it from all of the X-ray processes that are going on when uh, an intense X-ray beam hits the sample. So it's a timing trick, which has been used for many years and is well set up at sector three. So the magnetic measurements are indicated here Basically, it has to do with the fact that the different nuclear energy levels uh, between the ground state and the excited state of the iron 57 nucleus, uh, 14 kV separates the ground from the first excited state here. And there's a magnetic field which will split these at the nano electron volt level between the different transitions from the ground state spin to the excited state spin uh, following magnetic dipole rules. The uh, uh, transitions have slightly different energies uh, compared to 14 kV, it's very, very small. But nevertheless, uh, the wave packet, which is coming out from one of the nuclei is a little different from that, from a, a different nuclear transition. And these have a little bit of a beat pattern. These are sort of overlaid here as a more pattern to indicate that. And that works out to be in the nanosecond, uh, tens of nanosecond time regime. So when we have an interference between two levels, uh, we get this uh, intense uh, constructive interference, destructive interference, and so on. Uh, this is not actually the case for iron 57. There's uh, six transitions and the interference pattern is more complicated, but this is the general idea for how we can get magnetic information out of the nuclear forward scattering. Think of it as, for example, mass bar spectrometry in the time domain rather than the energy domain. The phonons are measured with nuclear resonant inelastic X-ray scattering. This is uh, not making use of those hyperfine features. <clears throat> Everything from the nuclear levels is lumped into a, a line here, which is on the order of uh, a, a, a very sharp elastic line, as a matter of fact, certainly compared to what the best thing one can get out of a monochromator would be, which is about a milli electron volt. Milli electron volt though is great for uh, scanning the uh, phonon spectrum, which may spread over uh, two orders of magnitude greater than that. So the idea is to monochromate uh, with uh, those uh, crystals I was showing a couple slides ago uh, and scan uh, through the nuclear resonance. And on this side here, uh, you can be creating phonons and on the left side, you can be annihilating them. And the phonon densities of states is something you can probe by this method. There's a thermal correction factor. <clears throat> this is quite a bit like uh, Raman, the Stokes and the anti-Stokes lines around the, uh, 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 the main wave length of your laser. We also see two phonon effects and so on. There's a lot of detail that we can see in the, the phonon spectra. I should point out it's from iron 57 nuclei alone. And so for INVAR, we have nickel, we can talk about that a little bit, uh, but uh, uh, that, that I'll mention that a little bit later. So 
this is the these are the two basic experimental methods uh, for the phonon part. I have some data here, which uh, was actually obtained by a CDAC student, uh, Lisa Mauger, a number of years ago, where she was looking at iron, pure iron, BCC iron, uh, as a function of temperature. And there's this giant elastic peak, which goes way off scale here, maybe by a factor of 20 or so off the scale. Uh, down at very low temperatures, you see something which is actually a pretty good representation of the phonon density of states. Uh, these are uh, states which are uh, uh, basically only half occupied and you can create one phonon in them and everybody's weighted about the same until you get very close to the elastic line. As you go up, you'll notice the appearance of a, a line down here or a spectrum down here where you're able to annihilate phonons. At 30 Kelvin, there just aren't any to annihilate. Uh, that would be, the only zero point occupancy is down here and you can't get energy out of the zero point level, uh, which uh, in spite of what investors may have thought in the past. So the uh, a number of features you can see here, one of them is detailed balance. So there's a uh, requirement for the phonon creation and annihilation side that if you're at an energy E, which say 25 milli electron volts, let's pick that one because it's room temperature, uh, the ratio on this side to that side is this E over KT. And if this is uh, uh, 25 milli electron volts, it should be a factor of E difference on the two sides. And it is, it's about a factor of E between the two sides, uh, plus or minus at the uh, room temperature. There's also a growth of multi-phonon scattering. Uh, roughly, this goes as temperature. Uh, you can see that uh, at about 1,000. Uh, 80 Kelvin and 500 uh, uh, Kelvin here is about twice the amount of multi-phonon scattering. We have a way of taking that into account. There's a very nice package called Phoenix by Wolfgang Sturhan, uh, who is at Caltech now, but prior at Argonne. We developed and maintained this and it works very well. So we can get the phonon spectra out nicely. Now let me go to some earlier measurements. Uh, this is the uh, citation. Uh, for uh, Charles Guillaume uh, when he won the Nobel Prize in 1920. Uh, actually, Einstein was slated to win it that year, but they alternated between experimentalists and theorists, so it was the experimentalist turn, and Einstein got it in 1921. <clears throat> for, but anyway, uh, this is for the services he has rendered to the physical precision technique by his discovery of the properties of nickel steel. In other words, it was a very big deal to have low thermal expansion materials for defining the length of the meter. Uh, it was a platinum iridium bar that uh, may be still in Paris, I trust it is, with a couple marks on it and they were trying to make duplicates, but it was so expensive that it was wonderful that uh, Guillaume discovered Invar uh, to make uh, uh, meter length uh, pieces of metal for a lot less money. Here's the thermal expansion of uh, Invar. Now there's actually some peculiarities down here at low nickel concentrations because there's some body center cubic phase and uh, there's he was a little confused by this unfortunately if you uh, read his write-up uh, but uh, it's face center cubic over the interesting range and notice how sensitive this low thermal expansion is not quite zero but pretty low uh, to the composition it's, it's very delicate uh, this is um, uh, a surprising uh, sensitivity of a physical property like thermal expansion. Now, Guillaume in his Nobel lecture had an interesting experiment that he reported. Uh, he made a long wire of INVAR, 115 meters, and he didn't have a lot of electronics, but he pulled it up to the second tower on the Eiffel, uh, second platform on the Eiffel Tower and connected it to a little pen recorder to a clock drum. And so as the uh, the Invar wire was attached to a peg in the ground, but as the Eiffel Tower expanded or contracted, he could measure the signal and he calibrated it well. Uh, so here's the data that he collected. He actually uh, collected temperature at the same time and the height of the tower uh, as it's thermally expanding. Uh, you can see the tracking is surprisingly good. I mean, it's a very impressive uh, uh, set of details. Uh, right here at around, what, six, 7 o'clock p.m., I guess uh, there was a rainfall and the temperature fell very quickly. Uh, the tower took a little while to respond. It's made out of uh, a lot of iron and uh, it uh, uh, had a little longer time constant. 
The, uh, I looked at these data and I looked at the amount of uh, expansion uh, per degree C, and I thought maybe I could get the thermal expansion of iron out of it. Uh, but it turns out I was off by a factor of two because I don't think the Eiffel Tower expands homogeneously in all directions. I think it buckles a little bit, and at least that's what I think. Now, Guillaume knew that INVAR was somehow related to magnetism because he looked at the behavior of the length of his, his uh, bar here as a function of temperature. And he noticed that after the Curie point, uh, it acted kind of normal. So he kind of extrapolated that back and he saw, okay, this is a region here uh, where we have the INVAR behavior. It probably has something to do with the uh, uh, magnetic properties changing, but he wasn't exactly sure. Now, this led though to some natural explanations of INVAR. You could say at high temperatures, we know that it has a smaller volume than you would expect by regular thermal expansion. And we also know that it uh, has a, a lower magnetization. So it's tempting to have a model where you have a high spin, high volume state at low temperature. And as temperature disorders the magnetization, then you get uh, to a low spin, low volume state, which uh, uh, is uh, the range of the INVAR behavior. So this led to a number of uh, uh, papers on this. I'm really sorry I, I can't go through all the literature. There's a lot of good work that was done on calculating, for example, uh, the uh, energies uh, as a function of lattice parameter uh, for different magnetic states of iron nickel alloys. This is an early one uh, from the 1990s. Uh, looking at a uh, simpler unit cell uh, of iron three nickel, not quite INVAR, but uh, it uh, basically indicates that there's a minimum here uh, where you have the uh, full magnetization, but in an antiferromagnetic state, the uh, lattice parameter is a bit smaller. So that kind of looks like the right type of behavior. And this was uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, more of a quantitative result than Weiss had in 1963 get a two-state model of this high spin, high volume going to a low spin, low volume state uh, as a function uh, of temperature. One of the issues that comes up with these calculations though is that the change in the lattice parameter is actually pretty big. Uh, it's uh, um, on the order here of what, 5% uh, or something like that, a few percent anyway. And that's more than uh, is really involved in the um, uh, thermal expansion here at low temperatures around room temperature. Now, this is all, uh, uh, there's a lot of literature here. As I said, I, I, there's a lot of pressure induced INVAR. There was a, a disordered uh, local spin uh, models that have been done. I can't do justice to it. And I apologize because this is good work and it really helps us understand the electronic behavior. But throughout all of these, there's practically no nothing on phonons and the regular thermal expansion. So what's going on with that? I did find a, a model, a theoretical paper, which was just sort of a toy model really, saying it, it might work this way, but uh, it was in a conference proceedings. It was not uh, a major paper. So here's the reason for the interest. If you look at the Gibbs free energy as a function of pressure and temperature, you have a, a Maxwell relationship, which is really easy to obtain. Uh, the uh, partial derivative with respect to temperature is the minus entropy. That's uh, uh, thermodynamically given to you. And you can look at then the next derivative with respect to pressure for the mixed derivative, and that's how the entropy depends on pressure. The other uh, order is you would take it with respect to pressure and you get the volume, PV. Uh, and then you take the temperature derivative of that volume, and that is the thermal expansion. Okay. So you can, uh, well, times the volume. Uh, if you wanted to uh, have INVAR with zero thermal expansion, if beta were zero, then there must be no entropy change with pressure. So there, of course, is a change in magnetization. We know the mag magnetism changes with pressure. And so we thought maybe we should look at what the phonons are doing. Is there a compensation effect here? Uh, how does this end up being zero? Uh, for uh, zero thermal expansion. Well, here's our little piece of INVAR. It wasn't nearly as long as Yoyam's wire, but it was enriched in iron 57. And 
we did this at uh, uh, Sector 3 uh, with uh, Guyan uh, Shen uh, to look at the uh, lattice parameter as a function of pressure. Uh, we did it at two temperatures, at uh, room temperature in the green, uh, the red uh, is at uh, 95 degrees higher. And the, there is not really any difference between these curves until you get up to about three or four gigapascals. The Curie transition we found uh, later from the nuclear forward scattering is a, a little higher than that. So it doesn't exactly coincide with the Curie transition, the INVAR behavior. But here, the insert shows our best attempt to pull out from these data the thermal expansion coefficient. And it's probably pretty low, uh, or INVAR behavior up to three gigapascals. Now, let me point out that that's really lucky. Uh, we, we didn't know that before we began this work, and it was a bit of a calculated risk. We'll try it, and we'll see if there's a range where we get INVAR behavior when we're under pressure, but pressures that are workable, not too low, not too high. Uh, but this works out surprisingly well for what we're going to do next. We got the uh, uh, magnetization uh, under temperature uh, uh, done in a calorimeter. Uh, to look at the heat capacity as a, as a function of temperature. Uh, the data we have from our curve is the solid black one. A couple from the literature are here. Uh, this is our uh, guess as to what the background would be. You're always fighting backgrounds at differentiating, dif differential scanning calorimetry. But we think we got an entropy out that integrates out about like this. If we integrate the heat capacity on T D T to get the magnetic entropy, uh, the uh, uh, behavior here above the phonons and the electronic part in this region gives us an entropy, which is about 0.1 kB per atom. Now this is a function of temperature. Uh, the forward scattering, which gave the magnetism, uh, show that we get a lot of quantum beats from the magnetic uh, um, interference effects uh, at, low temp at low pressures. Uh, this is at uh, ambient temperature here. And it goes away at about four uh, gigapascals. And above it, we get a, a thickness beat. Uh, we, we, we had a fairly thick sample. And uh, we had a, a zero hyperfine magnetic field, uh, at the magnetic field of the nucleus, which is proportional to the lattice magnetization, had gone away around uh, four gigapascals. So we were going through the, the Curie transition here as a function of pressure. Uh, now, I'll explain a little more our collaborations uh, with David Broido and Uli Hellman and, uh, and Matt Heine uh, at Boston University, uh, but Boston College. But let me just give an overview of some of the magnetization versus pressure data which have been done on, um, on INVAR. Uh, some of them, as you can see, aren't particularly good, but we put everything on this plot. Uh, some of them are... Uh, uh, X-ray magnetic circular dichroism measurements, for example. Our own data are these solid dots here uh, for uh, what we observe for the hyperfine fields. Our uh, theory co collaborators were pretty close. Um, we have to have uh, the same, we're normalizing everything here uh, at to zero uh, uh, pressure here and uh, through the Curie transition. Uh, so there's just a question of what the curvature looks like in here largely. Um, although some of them, we don't know really where they went to zero. Um, so it's not ferromagnetic at room temperature. It's got a lot of spin disorder already. Uh, there's a, a tendency to be aligned. At the Curie transition, it's rather uh, uh, disordered local moments. Now, there could be some short range correlations in there. And maybe that's different uh, under pressure than it is under temperature, but we're making the assumption that it isn't. Uh, if we take the uh, magnetization uh, from uh, bulk magnetization as a function of uh, a temperature alone and normalize it to the Curie temperature rather than the Curie pressure and uh, go through room temperature down here at zero, the curves are similar, okay? Uh, maybe ours are, are off, I don't know, but I think there's a little bit more uh, uh, curvature in the uh, behavior here as a function of pressure, but it's not a very big effect. That's not gonna make a huge difference to the final results. So we could make a model for what that curve looks like, and we picked the simplest we could. 
uh, which was basically uh, a uh, mean field model to get the entropy out, as you uh, typically do in uh, doing a, a Curie transition as a function of temperature. Uh, but here, here we're just getting not the uh, temperature dependence, but just how the entropy would depend on the magnetization. And we're going to assume that the magnetization as a function of pressure uh, gives the same entropy as the magnetization as a function of temperature. Uh, there may be some little differences I mentioned about the curvature, but the range seems to be about right. Also, we know a couple of things. We know that uh, we are uh, the same uh, at uh, ambient temperature and uh, uh, zero pressure. Uh, that's uh, done for both the uh, uh, thermal behavior and the pressure behavior. And I'm, uh, I know that the long range order is zero uh, at the Curie pressure or the Curie temperature. So in between, uh, we'll fit the, uh, uh, this type of a shape uh, to our magnetization as a function of pressure. Uh, here's the plot of the two of them. Uh, the, uh, from the calorimetry that I showed earlier, we have that gray curve. From the nuclear forward scattering, it might be a little bit more curved. Uh, it doesn't matter that much. The accuracy of the data points are not really that precise anyway. But basically, we have a, a range of these uh, uh, magnetizations giving uh, the uh, change in entropy with respect to our uh, ambient uh, conditions. Well, here's the phonon part. Uh, this is from the uh, nuclear resonant inelastic X-ray scattering uh, done as a function of, of pressure on the same Invar material. And some of it was done at the same beam time as the nuclear forward scattering. The uh, phonons down here have a, a peak from longitudinal modes, uh, at an energy of maybe 33 milli electron volts. There's uh, two Van Hova singularities from the low and the high transverse ac acoustic modes. Um, maybe this shows it a little better. Uh, you can calculate this density of uh, states with the Born von Karman model. Of course, you get sharper features in the calculation than you do with the experimental resolution, but I'm just showing us all together because the energies are in good agreement, the shapes are in good agreement. So the NRIX result, which only sees the iron 57, gives us this black curve. We also did inelastic neutron scattering. This was done uh, recently and in the past, and we've looked at iron nickel alloys. And it turns out that the nickel atoms really have the same vibrational spectrum as the iron. It's a pretty good approximation. When they're in the face center cubic structure, uh, the uh, vibrational uh, local densities of states for the nickel and that of the iron are about the same. So uh, we thought for this reason, we can pull out the total phonon entropy uh, from these partial DOS curves since the nickel basically gives us the same curve. Well, a couple things to look at here as a function of pressure. Uh, this longitudinal mode doesn't actually change very much with pressure uh, until you get past the Curie point that it changes, it, it increases. Uh, the, um, behavior uh, with the transverse uh, and uh, uh, acoustic, uh, acoustic modes are more conventional. They kind of stiffen uh, under pressure, uh, not too surprising a way. Well, here's the phonon entropy as a function of pressure. This, if you look, there's a lot of decimal points on this. And this was a real hassle to pull out data of this quality. Uh, there were questions on background. There were uh, questions on comparable statistics between the different runs and so on. But I think this is about right. I think we're being honest with our error bars are for the experimental points. And there's a, a behavior below the Curie transition in pressure, which is different from that above. Our theory uh, uh, collaborators have the advantage that they can turn on and turn off uh, the uh, interactions between the spin system and the phonons. So when they turn it off, they get a behavior which looks something like that. Uh, it's still a, a change, uh, uh, which is significant, uh, more rapid with uh, pressure than it is above the Curie transition. But they do uh, get an interesting curvature uh, down below it. So that's associated with the magnon phonon interaction, if you like, this difference between the blue and the orange here. Um, so put it together, we have the, uh, entropy from magnetization in the red on the top and the entropy from the phonons in the green. And the magnetization is being squeezed out with pressure. 
uh, the phonons, uh, uh, so there's more entropy with uh, uh, increased pressure for the magnetization. The phonons are uh, stiffening uh, with pressure. Not all of them are stiffening at the same rate, but generally uh, there's a lower entropy when you have a stiffer solid. The vibrations don't move the atoms so far. And they cancel out pretty darn well, actually. Uh, not all the way up to the Curie transition, uh, but maybe around to three or, or four GPA. Uh, this is a pretty flat looking curve. I claim this is the essence of the Invar effect. Uh, we have a uh, precise or reasonably precise calculate cancellation between the uh, uh, change of the magnetization versus pressure. That's one piece of the thermal expansion from our Maxwell relation. And that cancels the uh, phonon part, uh, how that changes is a function of pressure uh, of opposite signs. Uh, above, uh, the Curie uh, pressure, uh, we get a fairly normal thermal expansion. And we can actually use our uh, results from the uh, phonons, uh, the magnetization uh, we're ignoring. The phonon part would predict uh, about the right thermal expansion uh, above the, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, the Curie transition, as we saw from the uh, diffraction work we did on sector 16. OK, so we can also pull out, if we want, uh, the individual pieces of the um, uh, thermal expansion as a function of pressure. This is not so accurate, uh, especially around the Curie transition, which is worthy of uh, a bit more investigation, I think. Uh, the uh, rapid change of magnetization, rapid changes of phonons are doing some funny things here. But down, down, down here below about 3 GPA or so, where we have the INVAR behavior, you can see that the phonon contribution and the magnetization contribution aren't constant individually. Uh, they change in about the same way, though, uh, luckily, uh, to give approximately uh, a zero uh, for the uh, thermal expansion. So let me talk a little about the computational support for this, which is uh, uh, we can do much of it experimentally, but we can't uh, turn on and off the uh, uh, magnon phonon interaction. So this was based on work that Uli Hellman had come up with, uh, which he calls the temperature dependent effective potential method. But it was expanded uh, to include uh, disorder in the spin system and also a uh, interaction term in the Hamiltonian, which has to do with the separations, how the exchange interactions depend on the separation uh, between local moments. So it's a local moment model. It doesn't have a uh, band magnetism in it, but it does have uh, much of what we need. It's got the uh, uh, chemical disorder for iron nickel. It's a solid solution. Uh, and the temperature and the pressure effects on the phonons are included in a way that's been tested pretty well. Uh, the uh, approach is to make an ensemble of supercells uh, which satisfy a number of criteria. In this case, the ensemble had to satisfy an experimental criterion where the magnetization was appropriately right for that given temperature. The ones where the magnetization in the supercell was way off were discarded and they were not included in this calculation. So it's not truly first principles, it's measurement guided first principle calculation. But it did have in it spin orbit coupling, and I mentioned the dependence of the exchange interaction with the displacement from the phonons. And it was done iteratively. Uh, you would calculate an energy for uh, uh, each iteration on uh, an element of the ensemble, and uh, uh, you uh, displace uh, uh, the uh, atoms uh, in a way uh, to uh, uh, accommodate for the Hellman Feynman forces that, that you were pushing in a given direction and uh, uh, seek something which is consistent with the equilibrium and the canonical ensemble for temperature. So anyway, uh, if this, these are vast calculations, projected augmented wave uh, PBE uh, uh, on a supercell. Um, so one of the things I, I showed before is that you could turn on and off the um, interaction between the spins and the phonons, and that was helpful. Uh, but you can also look at a little bit more detail here, especially with the calculations that we can't see enough clarity in the experiments. Uh, the calculations with the uh, uh, spin uh, phonon interactions at the bottom here show that up to about four 
gigapascals, the longitudinal peak is not shifting very much, although the transverse modes are stiffening with pressure as they usually do, moving up in energy. Without uh, uh, the uh, uh, behavior connecting the phonons to the magnetization or fixing the magnetization, uh, you get the uh, uh, top curve, which is more normal stiffening of all of the phonons. So uh, the uh, stiffening uh, from the uh, first neighbor uh, radial force constants uh, is shown here uh, with the uh, full calculation and with a fixed magnetization. And uh, there is a, a modestly big effect, although if you look at the, uh, the scale here, it's not uh, uh, incredibly large, but it can certainly be seen. And it of course has to change at the Curie transition uh, when there's now a fixed magnetization of zero. So for the longitudinal modes, uh, we have the experimental points, which are the black ones, and the ones that were from the calculations, which are a lot smoother here, the crosses, uh, again, showing a, a behavior uh, somewhere around the Curie temperature uh, where these uh, uh, longitudinal modes now are no longer constant as a function of pressure, but uh, start to stiffen as they would normally be expected to do. So let me summarize what I've got here on the uh, entropy and INVAR. Uh, we based this whole uh, experimental plan on a Maxwell relationship. Uh, this is true when the system is in equilibrium. And for electrons, phonons, and spins, the time scale for getting to equilibrium is so fast compared to what you would measure from thermal expansion that I feel quite confident that we can use this Maxwell relationship reliably. We did have to have the INVAR behavior uh, in the useful range of pressure. And for that, we were lucky. I, we, we really didn't have uh, a, a great, uh, complete confidence as to what the range would be uh, for uh, the um, uh, INVAR behavior, but we kind of had a hint that we could squeeze out uh, the magnetism uh, with modest pressures and figured that within that range, we ought to have the INVAR behavior. And it's true, we did. So the essence of INVAR is that the change of the magnetic entropy with pressure balances the change in phonon entropy with pressure. Uh, they cancel rather well. And this is aided a little bit by the magnon phonon interaction, usually without uh, the, that interaction uh, under pressure, the phonons will just increase linearly with pressure with a Grüneisen parameter or something like that. But now with this uh, spin phonon interaction, uh, the curvature of that uh, phonon behavior matches a little bit better the curvature of the magnetization behavior. And the cancellation is a little bit more precise. You don't absolutely have to have that, but it's an interesting uh, feature that came out. It seems the effects from the electronic entropy were an order of magnitude smaller uh, as we were changing uh, the, uh, uh, the, the pressure. How does the electronic entropy change? Uh, this was a little harder to calculate on supercells of this size, but it, uh, we can make that statement with some confidence. So I have a little bit of extra time. So I'm going to move on from the, uh, uh, the INVAR although this really is the, the core of what I wanted to talk about, because I think we understand it. We have a, a manuscript which is going through multiple cycles in nature physics, but it hasn't been rejected. And some of the referees are enthusiastic. Uh, a couple of them are out to lunch, uh, but the editor doesn't know the difference. So uh, we're hoping that they'll figure it out and we'll uh, get this thing in nature physics so we don't have to restart this whole process again. Um, now, let me show you a couple of things about uh, phonons that we have seen uh, uh, over uh, uh, in relationship to magnetization. Uh, these are primarily temperature dependent studies, not pressure dependent studies, but they're pointing at something interesting, I think. So these are a few data points from Lisa Mauger. Uh, she uh, looked at uh, BCC iron over a very wide range of uh, 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 temperatures uh, through the Curie transition, and the phonons change quite a bit. Um, and let me tell you about how we have to approximate the anharmonic effects. What we usually do is we do a quasi-harmonic approximation because it's pretty easy to do a calculation on that. You just change the lattice parameter 
and you look at the changes in the vibrational frequencies. Nothing very special. They're still harmonic oscillators. It's just that they have different forces between them. So this is a standard quasi-harmonic approximation. And from that, you get Gruneisen parameters. How do the fractional change in frequency change with a fractional change in the volume? So if we change the volume a little bit, uh, the frequency usually goes down because the Gruneisen parameter is positive uh, and we uh, expand the crystal a little bit. Uh, the, the term on the right uh, will be positive and we're subtracted. So this is a uh, quasi-harmonic approximation. Uh, we have a, an energy that we have to take into account in the free energy from uh, the uh, uh, stretching of the bonds. You could treat it as, if you like, uh, with the uh, uh, pressure times the volume term, uh, or you could put it in the internal energy either way. Now, let's look at another very similar approach, which doesn't have justification, but I think it's interesting that it works. Let's make a magnetic Gruneisen parameter. So this is the fractional change in phonon frequency per fractional change in magnetization. So we change the magnetization a little bit. We'll change the frequency a little bit. Um, I defined the sign with a positive sign, I, I guess because I can. I've never really liked the sign of Gruneisen parameters. Uh, so this is very similar uh, in affecting an entropy term and we would have a magnetization uh, 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 type of uh, uh, term here. So let's take a look at how the frequencies do change as a function of magnetization. Of course, we would normally have both of them together. So the, we have to take out the quasi-harmonic part. Uh, we, we can do that uh, from uh, looking at the frequencies we measure as a function of temperature. And we can say, okay, we know the amount of thermal expansion. We'll remove this part on the left and see what's left over. And we were doing this because we were interested in enharmonic effects where we have phonon phonon interactions. But here I, I'm going to focus now on the alternative of having uh, magnon phonon interactions. So here's data from the low, high, and longitudinal uh, modes, uh, transverse modes of uh, BCC iron as a function of temperature through the Curie temperature. Now at low temperatures, you could either fit uh, a quasi-harmonic model uh, to the frequencies change with temperature with the Gruneisen parameter. You can look up Gruneisen parameters. There's many of them for iron. They're all about the same. They're about 2.2 or something like that. Uh, there is a behavior at the Curie transition, which is uh, interesting and it's not typical of phonon phonon interactions. Usually uh, when you have a quasi-harmonic behavior and then you have anharmonicity, there's a linear departure from the quasi-harmonic behavior, but this one seems to track a bit more the magnetization. So this is for BCC iron on the left. Uh, this is for cementite, Fe3C. It's a much smaller effect. I don't know if I completely believe it, but the scale of it is not very big. It's tenths of a milli electron volt. This is uh, changed by a few milli electron volts over here. Much bigger effect in the case of BCC iron than in cementite. All right. Uh, so. Here's plotting uh, the magnetization um, uh, uh, on the x-axis and the change of it as we go from ambient conditions um, down to uh, uh, towards the Curie transition. And this is the frequency shift we see of the phonons that are in the longitudinal and uh, the, uh, 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 sorry, this is the uh, uh, low uh, transverse mode here. And this is the high transverse acoustic mode, and this is the longitudinal mode. Uh, the low transverse mode changes much more rapidly, and it does track the magnetization, uh, approximately so, over a much bigger range of magnetization than I would have guessed. I would have expected it to be a small range. That might be true in cementite also. Uh, the uh, scale is much smaller. Anyway, uh, it, this is a um, spin phonon interaction. Uh, the Magnetization is being altered uh, as we uh, uh, um, as the magnetization changes. The the phonon frequencies are changed uh, approximately linearly, to my surprise. Um, so this should show up in pressure dependent studies as well. Uh, as you squeeze out the magnetization with with pressure, I would expect there's an effect on the, the phonons that that may well be linear in many cases. Um, but uh, I, I don't know. It's one of the things I'd like to look at. Um, the, uh, 
behavior of the free energy, uh, the phonon free energy, uh, is shown here on the left for BCC iron and on the right uh, for cementite. And we had to take out uh, the uh, quasi-harmonic part. So this is the deviation of the phonon free energy from the quasi-harmonic approximation. And it's big. I mean, this is like on the order of uh, 30 milli electron volts up to the uh, Curie transition. And this is enough to have a thermodynamic effect. And uh, our theory collaborators, uh, the Dusseldorf group with uh, uh, Neugebauer was arguing this is why the BCC iron is stable above the Curie transition before it becomes face centered cubic. There's about 100 degrees or something where you have non magnetic BCC iron. Now, the effect in the uh, uh, cementite is a lot smaller. The, it's on the order of maybe one, uh, one and a half milli electron volts. So that may be negligible in that case. But I was rather intrigued that this might be a way of probing uh, magnon phonon interactions uh, uh, by uh, taking a look at the phonon frequencies change uh, as a function of uh, magnetization. Uh, here are some parameters that we have, by the way, collecting all our Gruneisen parameters in one slide. For iron and cementite, the phonon Gruneisen parameters, a little over two. Uh, that's pretty standard for uh, Gruneisen parameters. And the uh, iron and uh, cementite are about that. Now, the different phonon modes have uh, different uh, magnetic Gruneisen parameters, differing quite a bit, and they differ enormously between iron and cementite. So there's a lot of complexity with this. But it, it, there's a couple of things you might think of right now. You may say, aha, well, the exchange interaction uh, depends on the atomic displacement. So uh, we might be able to uh, uh, build up some sort of a uh, uh, many body theory with uh, uh, phonons interacting with magnons. And there's actually a piece of that by uh, Silver Glit in 1969, it turns out. Um, he suggested, well, you have, he had a spin issue that he brought up that you know the magnons have spin, phonons don't. So you have to have two magnons created of opposite spins. Uh, for each phonon uh, that would be annihilated. Uh, this is going to be complicated, though, because all these magnetic Gruneisen parameters are very different. You would need to know the wave vector dependence for certainly all of these individual processes, probably certainly for the phonons and probably the spin excitations, too. I don't think this is going to be an easy way to go. But um, you also have to pay attention to electrons in this case. Uh, the uh, INVAR effect depends uh, uh, in its magnetization change on transfer electrons uh, of electrons from uh, the majority uh, T2G states to the minority EG states uh, as you get near the uh, uh, Curie transition. Uh, so the Fermi level behavior is important because it affects the electron phonon interactions. Uh, uh, the only way I can see forward with this, quite frankly, is a massive computer simulation. Uh, it might be building on some of the things that are uh, happening now in the theory community, but I, I can't know where this is going to go. I'm an experimentalist. Okay, so a uh, summary of effects that I've gone through. Uh, there's a zero thermal expansion of INVAR that I think we understand. I, uh, the missing piece was the phonons uh, as to why uh, the thermal expansion was zero. Uh, the magnetic entropy uh, is going to be um, going away. Uh, as you get towards a, a Curie transition, and that increases, uh, sorry, uh, the magnetic entropy increases, the spin alignment goes away. And the phonons, for example, under pressure, uh, are uh, uh, going up in frequency and their entropy is getting smaller. So magnetic entropy goes up, phonon entropy goes down, and they cancel very well, especially with spin phonon interactions added to the mix. And finally, in the second part, which I was speculating on, I really don't know what to do with this exactly, but I was surprised that there's a near linear relationship between the non quasi harmonic part of the phonon entropy and the magnetization it worked for both cementite and iron. And it may be a good way of identifying magnon phonon interactions uh, from the phonon spectra in the future, uh, but uh, I don't know for sure. Thank you. Thanks very much, Brent, for a beautiful talk, wonderful series of studies. The talk is now open for questions and comments, and I see Michael Demkowitz has already asked a question. Do you want to unmute yourself, or should I read it? 
I can read it or you can read it, whatever Go you ahead. prefer. Go ahead. Okay, so uh, this actually, you could almost think, first of all, great talk. I always enjoy your talk, Fred. Uh, so um, if the derivative of entropy with respect to pressure is zero, so the entropy must be at an extremum. Is it a maximum or a minimum? The, uh, this is as a function of uh, pressure, you're saying. Um, the other uh, uh, coordinate in here with the energy, I have to think about, it's more of a, it's not exactly a one dimensional function. Uh, we, we need to look at how um, uh, entropy depends on, uh, I mean, it's also, uh, energy minimum condition that usually goes with an entropy maximum condition, right, in thermodynamics. And so I, I have to look at where we are on that. I um, I don't think that I have a way of answering that from what I've got. I have uh, looked at uh, the uh, Maxwell relationship for thermal expansion, and that's of course not gonna give us the uh, Gibbs free energy uh, directly. It's looking at mixed derivatives probably it'd have to do some thinking about how that might integrate out. Okay, uh, I'm not quite sure I followed. Um, I, because it, it seemed to me like um, you were considering the question to be about what leads to thermodynamic equilibrium. Whereas I'm, I'm really wondering no. about... Oh, no, I'm just saying... Maybe, I, maybe the, I misunderstood. No, I'm saying if the, uh, the, the Gibbs free energy uh, now, it, it depends on what you're going to relax. If you're going to find an optimal temperature and pressure, if you could adjust those, uh, you can probably lower the Gibbs free energy below what we're looking at experimentally. But we do have a, uh, uh, a thermal expansion and uh, it is uh, minimizing a Gibbs free energy for the conditions under which we've applied it. Uh, so if we wanted to uh, relax the pressure, uh, we could lower the Gibbs free energy further. So I, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, I, what I think we're having here is we're having the minimum of the Gibbs free energy uh, for these conditions of temperature and pressure. That I will grant. But I'm not going to tell you uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the behavior around that minimum. OK, so second uh, question uh, was, whether we might expect to find other locations where the derivative of the entropy with respect to pressure is zero if we were to look over a wider range of pressures. Um, and, and is it simply a coincidence or a, or, a, or a nice accident that in the materials we know as invars, that zero derivative occurs at zero pressure? Uh, it's an accident, I, I will claim that. Uh, and. You can see why when you look at how sensitive it is to composition, uh, the thermal expansion of INVAR is really a delicate function of chemical composition. Now, that's not likely to come from the phonons. They're not nearly so sensitive to composition as you're changing the composition of the same crystal structure. The magnetization and magnetic behaviors are. So it, it's a, a tuned magnetic property, which cancels out uh, nicely uh, the, the phonon behavior here for INVAR. Uh, certainly one expects to see anomalies, though, and uh, effects from uh, not just magnetization, the Gibbs free energy uh, uh, could be uh, 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 associated with uh, uh, electric polarization, and you might be able to, to change that and get a, uh, as you're going through a ferroelectric transition, I would expect you'd also get an anomaly in the phonons as well, uh, for the same reasons. In fact, I think as you're having any uh, uh, thermodynamically uh, um, uh, uh, thermodynamic variable like temperature uh, uh, magnetization uh, uh, sorry uh, magnetization magnetic field electric field uh, you will be able to find uh, through the phase transition of one of them where there's an anomaly uh, you'll see macroscopic effects uh, on thermal expansion thank you very much Okay, thanks. Uh, Sasha has a question or comment. Go ahead. Question about um, uh, temperature dependent effective potential calculations. Uh, 
So mm -hmm. you mentioned uh, chemical disorder, which you know, added. It means like sites of uh, lighters could be randomly occupied by iron or nickel atoms in this case. So um, strictly speaking, you can't use band structure methods for this kind of systems. And well, typically people using so-called SQS structures, which are mimic like, uh, did you do something similar? Well, you can use a supercell, okay? And uh, you can then uh, do a uh, projection back into the primitive cell of face centered cubic uh, there's a, a uh, you, you can't project back the wave functions, but you can project back uh, uh, thermodynamic uh, uh, properties like energy. And uh, you can get a band structure uh, by uh, a band unfolding, I believe Alex Zunger called it. Uh, there's a nice paper with Zunger and Popescu uh, in an appendix. They describe the whole procedure. It's pretty clever, uh, but you can get back into the uh, uh, face center cubic unit cell from a supercell. And what you'll notice in the process is you probably are getting some uh, broadening of your bands as well. Uh, but uh, it, anyway. Thank you. Okay, thanks. So Urshan uh, has a question. He's another one of our MOSPAR experts. Uh, thank you, Brent, this beautiful talk. You showed one graph where you compare the NRIX measurements with the IXN measurements, you know, acid neutron scattering. Yeah, yeah. Iron three nickel. I mm -hmm. couldn't quite follow your argument there. Uh, okay. Could you get back to that slide? I could, but maybe I could make a statement that they were. Or at least similar. I wanted to know whether if it three nickel is a line compound or is it a solid solution? Oh. Uh, no, uh, this is a. Uh... Uh, solid solution, and we had looked at the same composition by inelastic neutron scattering, which meant we didn't use iron 57, okay, uh, it was natural iron. Uh, but the, uh, the point I was trying to make is that the uh, densities of states that you get from both methods are basically the same. They overlay pretty well, and the iron, uh, the NRIX, uh, has only iron 57 contributing. Uh, so it's only a partial DOS of the iron. For the neutrons, it turns out nickel is the stronger scatterer, uh, significantly stronger than iron. So it uh, has more than half of the intensity in the phonons is from the nickel. And so what it tells you is that the uh, nickel partial density of states is pretty close to being the same as the iron partial density of states uh, for this, this compound. Thank you. Yeah, okay, thanks. Uh, Igor, question, comment? Yeah, thank you very much, question. Uh, absolutely fantastic talk, Brent, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really ha happy because now when we didn't travel for quite a while, it was impossible. Absolutely fabulous result. I should have cited you. I'm, I apologize. I did not. There, uh, an excellent no, paper. No, no, uh, it's, from, it, I, I, yeah. My comment not about that. My comment okay. is a real question. So your experiment, uh, your experiment, does it allow to tell anything about pressure evolution of magnetic structure? Uh, so you, you, uh, you probably know what I mean. So can, can, yeah, yeah. can you resolve that? It's become so. As question number one, I would have a second question also. Yeah. Let, let me try to address that. Uh, I've been thinking about that a lot recently, and it would be, I think, very interesting uh, to do more uh, polarized diffraction measurements under pressure, if we could. Uh, I, I don't see how to do this very easily, unfortunately, uh, although the range of pressures isn't so high that it might be possible to do it with neutrons. Okay, we could have polarized neutron scattering, but it is pushing it a little bit. Uh, I think the real question is, Maybe we're getting different short range correlations under pressure than we are under temperature. Um, I don't think they're enormously different uh, because the entropy curves are kind of similar. So, uh, but there could be things to look at there. I agree. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you. And my, sec my second question. So you, your range of pressure, if you can still increase a little bit your range of pressure, uh, is it possible to, to think about experiment? I understand that every experiment is very expensive and very difficult. But if you take, for example, alloy with a little bit slightly higher iron composition, which is definitely not in war, 
Mm -hmm. you would be able to see the entire process. Uh, I think up to 10 gigapascal, if you can go up to 10 gigapascal, you can really start with non-NVAR, clearly non-NVAR system. And then increasing pressure pass it through this NVAR behavior. And then it would be really interesting to monitor how this cancellation of uh, entropy appears and disappears. Uh, I understand that it may be very, very difficult, but uh, technically, but it would be probably very interesting. Yeah, no, I think that would be a, a good research program is to inv investigate a number of other compositions. They have uh, a number of other magnetic and uh, 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 properties, different thermal expansions. Uh, getting into anti-NVAR would be very interesting, I think. Uh, I, I, I think, though, uh, we, we, I discussed this with my group, and uh, the way it works in science now is that you better aim for a high-profile paper. And if we aim off of INVAR, I'm not sure we can do the work, Igor. Uh, I agree. It's very, very sad, uh, modern development, but it is impossible. Yeah, I understand. That's, it's answering my question. Thank you very much. Thank you for this absolutely fabulous result. Well. Thanks. Thanks for the question. OK, one last question. Uh, Daniel? Uh, hi. Um, I was wondering if uh, this quite fundamental um, contribution uh, has an impact on how people interpret uh, magnetocaloric effects. Uh, you alluded to manipulating magnetism with magnetic field. And, and, and is there then corrections needed for how people come up with uh, um, magnetocaloric effects uh, by doing adiabatic measurements and so forth? Interesting. I, I, I have to say, uh, I apologize, Daniel. I don't know enough about those measurements. I, I think it would take a longer conversation uh, to, for me to think about what could be done there. I, I am aware of that to some extent, but uh, when you're bringing in uh, the contributions to heat capacity from the different components, uh, it should be relevant, I would think. But I, I can't say uh, exactly how to do a specific uh, uh, incisive uh, type of investigation. Sorry. Yeah, no, no problem. Okay, well, thank you, Brent, for an elegant talk. It's always wonderful to hear about developments in your, in your lab, and um, it's a beautiful set of applications of synchrotron radiation and uh, neutron scattering. So we'll have you back next year. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>